Well, today is Father's Day, of course, so happy Father's Day to my fellow dads out there, and even to those of you who are remembering your dads today. Happy Father's Day. I'm so blessed, blessed beyond words, to tell of my dad in my life, and even more than that, grateful that through his love and example, uh, I was able to trust the love of my Heavenly Father. So I hope that's true for you as well. But it's not only Father's Day, it's the tail end of what we call graduation season in our culture. Uh, all since, since May and all throughout June, thousands of high schools and colleges and universities have celebrated the pomp and circumstance of graduation ceremony. So I'm curious, uh, do we have anybody uh, in the room today who just graduated from something? If you graduated, raise your hand. Anybody? Okay. A couple. Congratulations. It's a big deal to graduate. Now, I suspect some of you actually attended graduations. Anybody attend a graduation ceremony? A few more of you. We won't clap for you because you just attended. <laughs> Anybody go to a graduation party? Oh, lots of graduation parties where they grill out stuff. Maybe even they grill out peppers, like Jeff said. <laughs> actually, the first service at Kessinger, he said eggplant. <laughs> Do you grill eggplant? I'm not sure. But most of us would agree that graduating with a degree, high school, college, grad school, is a good thing, a major accomplishment. But most of us would probably also agree that getting a, a degree is not the end goal. It's a step to a greater goal, right? It's a step to a greater thing, first paying off all your college debts, but then actually getting a job, doing something with that degree. But not a guy I read about this week. I wondered if you saw his story. His name is Michael Nicholson from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Here's what's unique about his story. Michael Nicholson is 71 years old, and to date, he has earned, okay, you have to listen carefully, one bachelor's degree, two associate degrees, 23 master's degrees, three specialist degrees, and one doctoral degree for a grand total of 30 degrees, and he's still working on another one right now, which of course makes him a graduate of the class of 1963. 67, 69, 70, 74, 75, 77, 78, 80, 82, and it goes on and on and on. So he has degrees in um, educational leadership, library science, school psychology, home economics, health education, and law enforcement. He even has a couple of seminary degrees. But here's the thing. He doesn't have a job and never has had a job <laughs> in any of the fields that he has studied. Here's his own explanation. Quote, I just stayed in school and took menial jobs to pay for the education and just made a point of getting more degrees. And eventually I retired so I could go to school full time. <laughs> One of his professors said, Michael likes going to school, he just doesn't like responsibility. Now, I'm all for education. I have a, I've been in school a number of years of my own life. But there's just something a little off, different weird maybe, about a guy with 30 college degrees that has done nothing with those degrees. Now we're going to see today in the Bible, in the book of James, that it's possible to do the same thing with our faith. We're in the second part of a series called Street Level Faith from the New Testament book of James. Last week Pastor Jeff told us that the book of James is actually an ancient letter, which much of the New Testament is, ancient letters, written in about 45 to 50 A.D., within a decade or so of the death and resurrection of Christ. So very early in the story of the church. And it was written by James, who most scholars believe this James is the half-brother of the Lord Jesus. That is, one of the children born to Mary and Joseph after Jesus. And so he grew up with him. And Jeff talked about the, the weirdness of how would you come to believe that your own half-sibling is the eternal son of God. That would be difficult. That's like sibling rivalry at the highest level, right? But he does. After the resurrection, James comes to be a believer and eventually comes to be the pastor, the leader of the church in Jerusalem during a very chaotic and dangerous time. Uh, historians tell us that the Jewish background Christians in and around Jerusalem were fleeing because of the, the severe persecution that erupted after the martyrdom of Stephen. You can read about that in the book of Acts. And James is concerned for his dear friends, his brothers and sisters in Christ. He's concerned not so much about doctrine and theology. He assumes that they understand the gospel. He assumes they put their faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. But he is very concerned about what their faith looks like in the real world. 
That's why we're calling this series Street Level Faith. He's not so much concerned about what faith is, about what they believe. He's concerned about what faith does, about how they are living in the world. Last week, we began by looking at the first part of chapter 1 in which James expresses concern that these early followers of Jesus were allowing their trials and the sufferings of their lives to distort what they believed about God. Remember, Jeff had the, he had the, the binoculars that he turned around. Uh, he says, don't see, don't allow the trials of your life to shape your image of who God is. Rather, allow your faith in a loving God and his character to shape your understanding of your trials. That was the main point of last week. Today we pick it up, chapter 1, in verse 19. So you can open your Bibles or watch on the screens as I read. And today I'm reading from the English Standard Version. James writes, Know this, my beloved brothers. I love that because James uh, is, can be quite blunt. He's, he's kind of straight to the point. But he's not unloving. He's a pastor at heart. My beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Okay, the first thing I see here is that James is telling his ancient readers and us how to be hearers of the word. He says, be hearers of the word. Now, every now and then in our house, the following scene takes place probably a little more often than I'd like to admit. But here's the scene. I'm sitting on the couch in our family room, and I'm watching, you know, something important on TV. You're ahead of me. The Cubs game, maybe one of my son's college baseball games. So I'm watching something important, and I'm focused because my team needs me, right? Guys, right? Am I right? you got to focus because your team needs your energy. And my wife will be just 15 feet away from me, maybe in the kitchen area, and she'll say something to me. I'm just 15 feet away, like from closer than here to D. And she will say something to me like, can you come over and help set the table? Or have you heard from the boys today? And what I will hear is, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> kind of like Charlie Brown, you know, his teacher. Wah, 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 wah. I'm vaguely aware that a human being is in the room speaking to me, but I don't hear words, actually. I don't. Um, and I don't hear because I'm focused on something else. I don't hear because I'm paying attention to other voices. I don't hear because I'm not listening. She actually has to walk in, stand in front of the TV, get my attention, and then I, then I hear. James says, verse 19, again, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, Slow to speak and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. A couple of questions. What was going on that James needs to say this? And by the way, when you read the Bible, particularly when you read the New Testament letters, ask yourself that when you read something. Why does the writer need to say this? What was going on in real life at the time? Because he's writing to real life people who once lived just like we lived. What is he responding to? What has he heard? What's happening? Now, being quick to hear and slow to anger is pretty good advice for any relationship that we're in, right? So often we, we fail to hear and understand the other person because while they're speaking, we're frantically putting together what we want to say next, right? I have a guy I, I see, he's not part of the church, I see him out in the community relatively often, and our interactions go the same way every time, and I fall into it every time. Basic greeting, then he asks me a question, and three words into my response, he starts talking about, some, about himself. 
and I fall into it every time. And it's so annoying. But then I realize I do that often myself. Because when whoever I'm talking to is talking, what I'm thinking about is not what they're saying, but what I want to say next, right? We do it all the time. We do it especially when we're in conflict or we're under pressure in marriage or in business. We see it in our wider culture, in social media. It's all just people shouting at each other, not listening to the other point of view. Most of us have a tendency to be quick to speak, quick to anger, and slow to hear. But I don't think James is talking about marriage here. I don't think he's primarily talking about social relationships or political opinions. I think James is talking about spiritual life. I think he's talking about relationship to God. Remember the situation. We know these Jewish background Christians were facing trials. That's how he begins his letter. They've seen their friend Stephen stoned to death right in front of their eyes. They've been driven from their homes by those who want to do the same to them. Many have lost businesses. They're living in far-flung places like refugees. We can assume that at least some of them are confused and struggling in their faith. Because James has already encouraged them to prayerfully ask for wisdom. To see trials through the lens of faith in God's goodness. He's warned them that trials have a way of producing doubt and temptation. Of distorting our understanding of the nature of God and his character. So we can assume that some of them are struggling with doubt. Starting to believe that maybe God has abandoned them. God has forgotten them. He doesn't love them anymore. Perhaps some want to respond to their suffering and to the injustice by fighting back, by getting revenge with anger. James is concerned that they've stopped listening. That they've stopped hearing Stop paying attention to the voice of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Now, just this week, I had a a conversation with a man who told me that earlier in his life, he was a believer, a follower of Christ, but through a series of devastating personal disappointments, he had consciously become embittered toward God and told God, I'm not listening anymore. I got my fire insurance in heaven, but I'm not listening anymore because I don't trust you. The phrase, be quick to hear, uh, carries a sense of listening well. Listening to understand, to learn. He's talking about hearing, understanding the voice of God through his word. Now, the word of God at that time would have been what we call the Old Testament. The prophets, the Psalms, uh, the Torah, the Pentateuch, plus the teachings of Jesus that were being repeated orally by the, the apostles, men like James, who knew Christ and walked with him. That was the word of God. He's saying be quick to understand and listen to the wisdom of God. To understand what he's trying to teach you. Don't allow your circumstances, your situation, your anger, your frustration keep you from hearing the wisdom that God wants to give you. Don't allow other voices, the voice of a hostile culture, the voice of an enemy who seeks to deceive and destroy. Don't let all the noise drown out the noise, the voice of the word, the truth of the word. Now, I think it's possible, in fact, I know it's possible, for you to be here today and for James to be speaking to you. Because it's possible to come to church here on Sunday morning because of what you always do, but you're preoccupied. There's something going on in your life. You're feeling stressed. You're thinking about finances. You're thinking about work. You're thinking about a son or a daughter who's in trouble. And you're having trouble even paying attention to what's happening because you're distracted by all the noise and chatter inside your own head. James says, stop. Slow down. Hear. Because God has something to say to you today. Be hearers of the word. Second thing he says to us is be receivers of the word. Be hearers of the word and be receivers of the word. When I was uh, in 10th or 11th grade, sophomore, junior in high school, I uh, had to take a class called trigonometry. How many, of you, how many of you remember taking trig? Let me ask you an honest question. How many of you enjoyed trigonometry? <laughs> All the engineers in the room, right? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. You have to understand, at that point in my life, I wasn't terribly serious about my academic life. I'm not proud of this, but my basic approach in high school was do as little as possible and still get a B. Not a, good, not a role model. Later, I became a little bit better student, but I wasn't then. On top of that, I really did not enjoy math. 
That, that's, that's, uh, that's not true. I hated math. I, despi- I, I could not figure out the purpose of it. Because once I learned how to calculate my batting average <laughs> or my shooting percentage, I was good, right? What else do you need math for? I didn't understand the purpose of geometry and trigonometry, but it was required, so I, there I was. After several weeks of class, I was pulling a pretty steady, a pretty solid D in that class. I didn't understand what was going on. And my teacher, who was an odd man named Mr. McCaffrey, uh, he, he uh, called me in for uh, a conference in the middle of a school day, like over lunch. I had to go to a conference with a teacher. Now, I knew I wasn't doing so hot in trigonometry, but... That was, I mean, that was a little over the top, a little overkill, a conference with the teacher. So I planned to go in and, you know, nod my head a lot and say, I promise to do my homework, I promise to do better, blah, 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 just get out of there. Unbeknownst to me, he had also invited my football coach to the same meeting. And now my football coach was a man named Coach Gennaro. I call him Coach J. He's still a friend in my life today. But at that time, I was, uh, I feared and respected him at the same time. I was terrified. So I walked in, I saw him sitting there. And Mr. McCaffrey, I, I started to sweat because I knew I was in trouble. I was in deep trouble. So Mr. McCaffrey proceeded to lay out my grades right in front of my football coach. He was really talking to my coach, not me. What he said was, Coach, I don't understand how a student like this, he just pointed to me like I was a thing, you know, like a student like this can put so much effort and discipline into football and so little into his classwork. And I'm looking down the whole time like, oh. <laughs> And then my coach looked at me, and with, these, with his beady little dark eyes, stared into my soul, and he said, Son, looks like we have a problem of motivation. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right, because I was resistant. I was resistant to the word of trigonometry that Mr. McCaffrey wanted to implant in me. And so my coach proceeded to motivate me. I think all the way to a C-plus by the end of the semester. Verse 21, Therefore... Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. What does it mean to receive the implanted word? Well, first he says it means to put away some things. To put away filthiness and rampant wickedness. Put away sin and disobedience. Now, he's not saying that we have to clean our acts up before we can receive the grace of God. That's not what he's saying. That's not the gospel. But he is saying the implant, the word will not grow deeply into our lives when our hearts are cluttered with other things, when our hearts are cluttered or hardened by sin. The, root, the, the word cannot grow there. I think he's maybe remembering his older half-brother's teaching, Jesus' teaching in a parable called the parable of the soils. In Matthew chapter 13, we read that parable. It tells a story about a farmer who goes out to sow seed. Some seed falls on hardened soil. The birds swoop in and snatch it away. Some seed falls on rocky soil. The, the seed cannot grow root. Some seed falls on thorny soil. It grows, then, then it's choked out by the weeds. Some seed falls on good soil, and it produces a harvest. Now, the soil is the condition of our hearts. And the seed is the gospel. What James calls the implanted word that can save your soul. I think we have a tendency, particularly in, quote-unquote, the evangelical church, to reduce the gospel to believe in Jesus and go to heaven when you die. Believe in Jesus, go to heaven when you die. And of course, that's true. But that's not all the gospel does. The gospel, when received by faith, does give us a new heart through the forgiveness of sin and new destiny, which is the promise of eternal life. That's true. But it gives us more. Because the gospel also gives us new identity. Over and over again in the New Testament, we're told we are adopted as sons and daughters, which means we are no longer defined by our culture, by our our racial background, by our education. We're no longer defined by our families or even by our failures in past. We're defined now only by the love of Christ and his redemption in our lives. We have new identity and we have new destiny. Excuse me, new purpose. We no longer live for ourselves, but we serve our Lord Christ and his kingdom made manifest in and through the church. That's the gospel. A pastor named Jared Wilson in a book called Gospel Deeps writes, We like that our gospel gets our sins forgiven and gives us a ticket to heaven, but we're not sure of its functionality in our, day, in our, in our lives every day. I think that's why James writes this letter. 
James is saying, when you receive the implanted word that can save your soul and it begins to grow, it gives you a new life. Jesus summarized by saying, you must be born again. That is, at the street level, at the real life level, it means we've been given a second chance through the gospel to live a different life, to live a new life, to live out of a different identity and to live a different life. Now, notice, none of this has anything to do with our circumstances. It has everything to do with what God has already done in and through Christ in us. So James here is reminding these ancient Jewish background believers in Christ, he's reminding them who they are. And then challenging them to live out of that new identity in a new way. And that leads us to the third point. He says, be doers of the word. Be hearers of the word, be receivers of the word, and be doers of the word. Some time ago, I came across, uh, heard someone talk uh, describing the differences between men and women. You've got to be careful when you do that these days. But he, he was describing some of the differences in how men and women look into mirrors. Here's what he said. He said, uh, women have been taught by our culture their whole lives to look into mirrors and to see all of their flaws and imperfections. That's what our culture has done. So women look into mirrors and they see, you know, skin, their, their hair, their eyelashes, uh, and then they have a myriad of products designed to sort of mitigate and address those perceived imperfections, right? Which is why God invented two sink bathrooms, but that's a different story. <laughs> a, man, a man rolls out of bed, stumbles into the bathroom, looks in the mirror, grabs a toothbrush and goes, looking good. <laughs> <laughs> and generally, that's true. And there's something true about actually each approach to looking in a mirror. Now, the purpose of a mirror is to allow us to see ourselves as we are. But we often see somewhat distorted images, don't we? Our perceptions are a little bit different. Kind of like those funhouse mirrors you see uh, where that, are, that distort your image. Some make you look really long and skinny. Some make you look round like a beach ball. And we laugh. But I saw a study recently that showed that most people tend to do this. We tend to misrepresent ourselves on surveys, for example. This is, this is widespread, so you don't have to admit it here or there, but it's true for most of us. That is, when asked if we exercise regularly, most of us will check the box reporting that we exercise twice as much as we actually do. When asked about charitable giving, same thing. When asked about attendance and worship, same thing. People will sort of fudge on the positive side to make themselves appear a little more diligent or a little more generous than they actually are. It's just how people are. You know, 95% of people think they're above average. You've got to think about that a little bit. So the mirror we use to see ourselves is warped just a bit. James encourages us to look at a different kind of mirror. Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Okay, what's James saying here? James is telling us that the gospel is a different kind of spiritual mirror in which we can see ourselves as God sees us. And so how does God see us? Now, I think most of you right now are thinking this way. This is the thought that crossed your mind. Well, God knows everything. He sees all that I am. So he sees all my flaws. He sees how sinful I am. He sees all my failures because he knows everything. And so he must want me to see that as well. He must want to remind me over and over again of how far, far I fall short of his holiness. That's the mirror he wants to hold up to me. But that's not what James is saying. That's not what I think he's saying. He's saying the exact opposite. Now think for a moment about the gospel that I just went through moments ago. The gospel is the good news that in Christ you are a new creation. That's what the Bible says. The old is gone, the new has come. So it's as if you can put on a neck mirror. My mom used to have one of these when I was growing up. I know it looks funny. Jeff had his binoculars, I have my neck mirror, okay? Okay, so the gospel is the good news. The gospel mirror tells us that we've been given new hearts. 
to the forgiveness of sin, all your sin, past, present, future, wiped away, nailed to the cross, the Bible says. You have new identity. You've been adopted as his children. You share as an heir, and all Christ shares in as his inheritance. You've been given new purpose and new destiny. So James is saying, you don't have to pretend to be better than you are. I didn't think about doing this when I had my mic on. You don't have to pretend to be something different than you are. You don't have to fudge the results. Nor do you have to look back at your past and remember all your failures. No, the gospel mirror is different. You can now see yourself as God sees you in Christ. Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. What does James mean by the perfect law? By the law of liberty. He's writing to Jewish background believers who had grown up with the law. They knew what the law was, the Torah, the Ten Commandments, all the rules for holiness. But James is not talking about that law. He's talking about the perfect law, the law of liberty. Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The law of liberty in James is the law of life in Paul. So in Christ we are set free from the mirror of our past. We're set free from the mirror of sin. We're set free from the mirror of condemnation. We're set free from slavery to our circumstances. We're set free to see ourselves differently as God sees us. Therefore, we are set free to live differently. That's what James is saying. And then he closes with this, verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious... And does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I believe this is the only place in the New Testament where the words religious and religion are used in this way. Primarily because Christianity, of course, is not a religion. Properly understood, it's a relationship. But here he uses the word religion as that was just practiced outwardly, but it has no impact on a person's heart, their inward being, and therefore fails to impact how someone actually lives. He's saying that any religion that fails to produce life change is worthless because it has failed to transform the heart. And then James wraps up this section of the letter by giving us three examples of what being a doer of the word looks like. Just three. Of all the things he could talk about, we'll talk about many in the weeks ahead. First, speech. How we talk. He says, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Again, talk about this much more in a couple weeks. But our words matter. Our speech matters. Secondly, compassion. Verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows and their affliction. Compassion matters. That's why Chapel Street, we as a church family, are involved, deeply committed to ministries like Naomi's House, helping women escape the brutality of the sex trade industry, uh, Lazarus House, Royal Family Kids Camp, which just finished a week or so ago, Shepherd's Heart, uh, Buddy Breaks. Why we're involved in compassionate ministries because our service, our compassion, is our currency in the world. What we say we believe has no credibility in the world around us without compassion. Compassion matters. And thirdly, he says, purity. And keep oneself unstained from the world. That word actually means keep from being polluted by the world. Our behavior matters. How we live matters. Here at Chapel Street, we say it like this, and I think James, I think James would like how we say this. Jeff said it earlier today. We want people to experience grace, grow in faith, and have an impact right where they are. To experience grace, that's the gospel. To grow in faith, that's the implanted word growing deep and have an impact where they are. In other words, to be hearers of the word, receivers of the word, and doers of the word. 
I like to say that truth shows up in unexpected places, and it, and it does. All truth belongs to God, and truth shows up in all kinds of unexpected places. Think movies, for example. Guys who go to team know I show movie clips all the time because, that, because truth shows up in funny places. I believe the movies we come to love, stories that we come to love like Gone with the Wind or Wizard of Oz or Braveheart or Terminator, as the case may be. But the stories that move us, I think most of them are all echoes, sort of shadows of the great story that the Bible tells. The great story of sacrificial love that redeems all things. And so it is with one of our family favorites, a movie called Lion King. All of you have probably seen it and know it. came out in 1994. Yikes. Today it's one of the, uh, gross, the top grossing musicals of all time on Broadway. It's something like over 8,000 shows or something like that. Because it tells a wonderful story. The story it tells is the story of a Simba, who's the cub son of Mufasa, the great king. And Mufasa dies in an accident that's orchestrated by jealous and evil Uncle Scar. And Simba thinks it's all his fault as a little young cub. So Simba goes into hiding, and he runs away from his destiny as the true king. And he doesn't want to be king. He doesn't believe he's worthy to be king. So he runs away. But Mufasa appears to him in a kind of vision or dream at the end of the story and takes him to a reflecting pool. And he shows him, he shows Simba his own reflection. And for the first time, Simba sees himself as Mufasa sees him. And Mufasa says to him, and here's where truth comes, you are more than what you have become. Remember who you are, he says. I think that's what James is saying to these ancient first century believers. Remember who you are. And live out of that. And he thinks he says the same thing to us today. Remember who you are. Would you bow with me as I close? We thank you for your word today, Lord. And we thank you for this powerful reminder from the pen of James. That we are called to be not just hearers, but receivers. And not just receivers, but doers of your word. And that all that we do flows from what you have already done in us through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.